Hi, I'm Dhruv Mathur, co-founder and CTO at LBB. And today I'm going to talk to you about applying data science to product management. My background, um, I grew up in Delhi, went to college at Carnegie Mellon in the US uh, and started out as an engineer, as a developer, building websites, uh, doing e-commerce apps and then kind of got into product management and engineering management. And today I'm going to share uh, my learnings uh, on Upgrad's grassroots. So I've been building products for close to 10 years now. Uh, that tells you a bit about my age and what I've really learned is that building a great engineering team is like building a time machine. Let's get into it. And if you think about it, we haven't really got into understanding what is this perfect process, right? Maybe we know what it is in the factory, but we definitely don't know what it is for a technology startup. And if we did, there'd be a lot more unicorns out there than there are today. What I've really realized and really learned is that there is no perfect or there is no one size fit all process. Great companies the world over have innovated for what works for them. Great example, Spotify for, is one of the pioneers of the pods or squads concept where there are few number of people working on a problem statement. These few number of people are from engineering, product, business and they together are responsible for shipping something or for moving a certain metric. If you think about a great Indian company like Zeroda, right? Huge uh, trading platform, millions and millions of customers with billions of trades happening on their platform and connected to very, very regulated systems that are backed by pretty archaic and old school tech. And they have 30 people who built that. If you think about how many people work in one bank in their IT division versus what it took Zeroda to build what they did, that's crazy. There's nothing that looks similar between the processes they follow. So where do you figure out what process works for you? And really, I think it starts with first and foremost understanding yourself as a leader, as an engineering manager, and as a product manager, and also understanding your team, right? What kind of people are they? Are they active problem solvers? Are they deep thinkers? Are they people who love firefighting or do they love planning? Once you start to understand that, that's when you start to really realize what kind of process can actually fit for your team to deliver on great software and on great products. And that is one of the most critical aspects to understand when forming and understanding what type of process that makes your team start to control time when it comes to engineering. One of the most critical areas that an engineering manager or a product leader needs to manage is cost. What does it take to build great software, be it in the infra, in the tools or the team that you have? Everything comes at a cost. And if you can manage your cost effectively in the budgets that you have, you can actually end up either buying time or investing in things that really bend time. So let's talk a little bit about buying time, right? The way I found an easy, the way I found it easy to make that choice is to really think about two factors, right? First, is it easy and fast for your team to be able to learn how to build that technology? Or is it a type of technology that takes experience and time to really learn? The second factor, is it something that is core to your product offering and very important to get right? Or is it non-core and is just additional to what you're building for your customer? Let's take a couple of examples. Simple thing that most consumer apps and business apps need is notification and email systems. Notification and email systems are available a dime a dozen. You can get them off the shelf, you can plug them in and you can go. And unless you yourself are building one of those platforms, it's not really core technology to you. Now you may think, hey, email servers, setting it up, setting up the stack, that's easy. My team can learn that. Sure, but is it really that what you want them spending their valuable time on? Would you not rather just buy that time and buy that software? Another uh, great example is personalization models. Let's say you're building machine learning models or algorithms that help personalize a specific offering in your product to the end consumer. For example, in Zomato, you're trying to figure out, you know, what kind of burger do I show this person to order for lunch? Now that is very, very core to the experience that a customer is going to have on your product. And you know what, that's not simple to learn how to build. There's so many factors that go into it that are unique to your ecosystem. There are so many different nuances that you may want to include. And also it takes time to know if things are working in the direction that you're going. And it requires experience to know how to really get this right. That's something that you may want to keep in house. That's something that you may want your team to really excel at. 
and that is maybe somewhere where you want to invest and not really buy something but spend the time to make it and put your time as cost in that area. So that's a little bit about how you can think of cost management as buying time. Let's also talk about cost management and about managing your infrastructure to bend time. If you think about how you make investments, right? If you invest in a mutual fund or you invest in a stock today, typically your largest returns are seen over a longer period of time. Of course, if you're lucky, you'll have a great day trade, but that happens once in a while. Some of the best returns comes when you're in it to win it over a longer period. Same thing applies in when you build layers of your technology platform. A very good example here is when you're building tooling for your development team or when you're doing th things in DevOps, right? So DevOps is a process by which you make it easier for your teams to be able to deploy code to production, to be able to test it and to be able to make sure it's of a high quality. The easier you make doing DevOps, the easier you make it for your developers to be able to test and deploy code and the better tooling you have in that area, that tends to make it faster and faster for them to build features and to build the product over time. Now in the beginning, it's very hard to convince other people to invest time in DevOps, to invest money in DevOps as well. But it is something that you, if you invest in today and you continue to invest a little bit over a period of time, you can see exponential returns over a longer period of time and you can see it impacting your growth and the pace of your growth over a much longer period of time. At LBB, we have folks working with us from all parts of India from very diverse backgrounds. We have creative folks, we have folks who are amazing at creating content, we have folks who are very good at product and very good at engineering. But what I've really seen is the personality types are, well, all over the place. Folks come with very different motivations. Folks come with very different ways of working. Some people like to really get into the details and think about how they can build something. Whereas other people like to think about how they can market it or how it look really cool for the customer. So how do you bring all these people to work together towards common goals? That key metric we talked about, work together towards growth for your startup. One tool or one approach I've found that works really well is spending time with different teams on coming up with common interfaces. Now, common interfaces sounds like a very technical term and it's really not. It's actually sometimes the most simplest things that you can build that makes two different types of people work very well together. Well, spend a bit of time on how they communicate. How does one team get its requirements or get what it's trying to do to the other team? Frequently, if you leave it up to any one team, they'll write it or they'll tell it or they'll show it the way they think, the way they want it to be, the way they want it explained to them. They frequently won't think about their counterparts and what works for the other party. If you spend a little bit of time and come together to have some common frameworks, common documents, maybe even just common spreadsheets that both parties really agree on and understand effectively and also are able to meet the goals of both parties, both to understand the why and what we're trying to do and how we can build it, you can make magic happen and make it super easy for folks to work together, do great work and really again deliver growth in a great time. We've been talking about how you make great decisions to really manage time and to deliver on growth for your startup. But let's talk about the time machine, the team itself that actually makes that happen. How do you build great engineering teams, product teams, creative teams, any kind of teams for your startup to deliver on growth? Because that is one of the most impactful ways you can actually really, really take time to your advantage if you have the right teams working on the right things. One of the things about building teams is it evolves over time. And how you start doing it in your early days when you're small, when you're four or five people in a room and just looking to break out, and how you do it much later when you're maybe hundreds of folks and you really want to expand what you're trying to do is very, very different. But one thing that doesn't change is how you make decisions about the people you want to hire and how they resonate with your value system and your company's value system. In the early days, when I was building teams at LBB, a lot of it came from how I felt my values were. I care about if we deliver on time. I care about being very experimentative and I care about having a high quality experience for my consumers. And that's what I really talked about to the people that were coming to our company. I 
looked at them and said, you know, do you believe in the same things I believe in when we're trying to deliver a product and trying to build something um, that will affect millions of consumers uh, in India today? And that really framed how we hired some of the most earliest hires into our company. Folks who stayed with us, grew with us and have been here since. As the company grew and as we actually started expanding as a team, I really saw that this became a core part of our culture. Everyone around us, everyone in our teams cared about the same things we cared about when we started out. But you know what changed? I changed. The things I cared about started shifting. I started caring about maybe making some mistakes and letting things out go faster. I started caring about what are the experience for businesses, not just for customers and making trade-offs over there. And that really was very interesting for me to experience because now the company and the company's culture was larger than myself. And at that point, it was very important to keep the values and keep the culture with which our company runs be the forefront while keeping my own values and maybe the way I had evolved on a back burner and letting people come into the company that really fit with the overall team and the overall mission. Over time, this has changed. My value systems have changed. I have changed. But what really stayed constant was the growth of that initial team, that initial value system we put into place and how it attracted talent, how it attracted people. And that's something that you need to think about when you're actually hiring and building teams early on and later on as well. A concept that's particularly unique to startups today is how you think about people's growth within your company. And this applies not only to engineering and product teams, where it's very important to think about what kind of value you want them to deliver, but it actually applies honestly across the board to all different teams. Not everybody wants to manage people and be a manager. People want to grow in the ways they feel best for doing the work that they want to do. A great example is Google. Google is famous for having different levels of engineering and engineers and their engineers at the highest levels are world renowned. They are people working on solving some of the most hardest problems out there and not because they had to manage other people or become a manager but because they could become a certain level of engineer within Google. Google allowed a ladder to be developed for engineers that became a standard for many other companies in Silicon Valley and globally. That may have bent the rules of how human resources worked or talent worked, but really it created an ecosystem where people at Google could do the best work of their lives and create impact not just within Google, but in the world. You should think about this and reflect on it as you're really starting out on your startup journey or when you're trying to really think about how you can evolve and you're trying to grow your startup beyond the stage it's reached. Do you have the right growth paths? Are you making sure all your people can deliver the best work of their life and are getting the opportunity to grow the way they would want to grow. That's something that's really, really interesting to do right. And if you get it right, you can make, again, many beautiful things happen in a very, very fast-paced time frame and deliver on great growth for your startup. I hope you got to learn from my own learnings of building a startup over the past couple of years. We talked a little bit about how you can both manage costs and invest in technology. We talked about building teams and building growth paths and interfaces for those teams and how to really think about processes that work for you to grow your startup and product super fast. Don't forget to check out the other videos on Upgrad's Grassroots playlist. There's a lot of great information out there. That's all for me today. Thank you so much. Goodbye.